the financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of TGAF, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. You know, one of these days I'm going to have to go to one of those Scrabble calculator decipherers and put in TGAF, CTBK, CPA, and see if that can even make a word. That's a lot of letters that probably can't make any words. Uh, joining us, uh, he's, he's uh, volunteered to be my friend today because Jonah Bronstein and Matthew Fairburn are uh, out of service. Here is Sal Mayorana of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. Thanks for doing this, Sal. Hey, no problem, Tim. You got me out of further uh, hardwood floor shopping with my wife. Man, I was there just last summer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll just, yeah, tell me when to lift the lid on the hatch, you know, on the, on the SUV and, uh, you know, where I, where I, who I talk to with the credit card and, you know, whatever else. I don't know if that's your great, system. Not a great place to be. Actually, it's funny. She's the one who doesn't like to spend money. I'm the one that's like, okay, let's do it. Let's get it done. And she right. doesn't want to spend, so. More money in this situation generally means less work. True. That's true. That, that's why I, that's, that was where I'll just invest in, I'll invest in quality and <laughs> uh, then we'll be done with it. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy that I can help you out of that. Thank you. Uh, Sal, it's a slow time for football writers, but not a slow time for New York Yankees fans. Uh, I thought it would be a perfect time to talk with you uh, because we can talk about your beloved Yankees uh, while also previewing the start of Bill's training camp in a couple of weeks and some of the top stories uh, that we should be looking at at the start of, of training camp. But there's been some news with the Yankees today coming out of the all-star break, supposed to start a four game set with the Boston Red Sox. And we already have a postponement uh, because the Yankees uh, have tested, uh, or I, I guess I, I don't want to say this. I don't know exactly what it is, but there are COVID problems with the Yankees, uh, namely with Nestor Cortez and Wandy Peralta. There's already somebody on the COVID list. And so they kind of shut things down today. We don't need to get into the COVID aspect of it, Sal, but just in general, this Yankees season has been something. How are you digesting this team on a day-to-day -day basis? <laughs> well, let me just, I'll say this, Tim, you know, COVID is a serious issue and it's unfortunate what has happened today, but I got to say, it means one more night of bliss for me not having to watch this team. So I'll take the postponement. I hope everybody's okay, but I, I'm not really upset about that. But yeah, it's been, I'll tell you, Tim, you know, Yankee fans get a really, really rough go from all other baseball fans because we should have nothing to complain about, right? I mean, it's been almost a century of excellence with this franchise. They're the most decorated team in sports history, yet we always find a way to be pissed off. And generally it's, we're insane, but Tim, this team they have given us every right and reason to be pissed off this year because they have been a disgrace. I've used the word disgrace in relation to them probably in 30 tweets so far this year. Every night I'm, I'm tweeting, what a disgrace. It, I, it's hard to explain because they're not the Pirates. They're not the Marlins. They're not these stupid teams that can't spend any money and they're cheap. But the roster that they've constructed, Tim, I'll use the word again. It's just a disgrace what they were thinking when they put this roster together. It's, and and, and what's, what's even worse is they were supposed to be the guys they have. You look at the back of the baseball card for all these guys, you would expect that they should be in first place and, and right there. And they've all underperformed to such a remarkable level that it has created angst from day one until last Sunday when my wife will tell you she was ready to kick me out of the house 
when they lost that game in the bottom of the ninth inning, the way they did, my blood pressure, Tim, and I know it's kind of irrational. It was through the roof. And that's been the case so many times this year. And they'd won five out of six going into that game, though. Exa- this is what I'm talking about, why we we Yankee fans are kind of assholes, because we shouldn't be as, as insane as we are. They do win more than they lose. But, Tim, they have had losses this year. There's been at least three that I can think of off the top of my head that are almost to historic proportion, how ridiculous they lost these games. And we're just not used to that, you know? The, the, you know your Indians can lose – like that, but the Yankees just can't lose like that. It's been unbelievable to watch. I really don't. Ha- I guess I do. I get mild satisfaction out of the Yankees struggling. I mean, I don't really, I don't love it. You know, like I really enjoyed watching the Miami Heat lose when LeBron and D Wade and Chris Bosch were supposed to win five straight titles. You know, all those things that are supposed to happen. I take a glee when those things don't happen. So that, but the Yankees have been doing it. Uh, they've had a lot of these types of seasons mm-hmm. that I've, so I've gotten my satisfaction over the years out of the Yankees when they spend a ton of money and don't get the result. So my, my satisfaction is down a little bit, but I'll tell you, uh, I really, really enjoy what has been happening with the role this chap for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't like him as a human being. Uh, there's that. So even if you want to separate the art from the artist, Um, it is still, I guess the journalist in me, it is a hell of a story. Even if Aroldis Chapman is the nicest guy in the world, what happened where he was lights out for a couple of months and now no matter what, I mean, I happen to be watching that rain delayed game. They come back uh, against the angel or was it the card angels, angels, angels. And he gives up the grand slam and I was, oh my Lord. Uh, and then now when I hear he's entering a game, I have to flip the channel from usually yeah. my Cleveland Indians game to the Yankees. I have to see what happens. And um, look, we've, we've seen it before and we've covered stories like that where the the momentum of the, the schadenfreude, as they call it, it's like, I kind of want it to keep going. I want, I kind of yeah. want it, I, but, uh, but I know you as a Yankee fan, I'm, I'm sure that's got to be one of the worst aspects of the season is – well, it, it absolutely, run. it absolutely has. But I mean, th- their, their biggest problem all year long has been their offense. Their offense has just been horrible. They're so one dimensional. Um, you know, they're so right handed too, which in, in this day and age, you just can't be that one sided at the plate, but they just all underperform so badly on offense. But you're right. Chat, the Chapman story really is kind of taken on a life of its own. Really. He was the most locked down guy for the first two months. They didn't give up a run in the first two months of the season and throughout his career, you know, say what you want about the guy. He is probably an asshole. Uh, and he, we have the proof with the domestic violence uh, trouble that he got into, but he has always been a pretty reliable lockdown closer. We're used to you know, Mariano Rivera for 14 years. No one could ever top that. And I'm not saying Chapman has ever been that reliable, but he was pretty damn close. Sometimes there's been stretches. He's been unhittable like he was early in the year. So what's happened in the last month, you know, everyone is pointing to, he must've been one of these guys that was really gobbing the ball up with sticky stuff. It has to be, I mean, it's the, the line of demarcation is very clear. As soon as the as major league baseball made it a point that they were going to start checking in whatever it was going to be two weeks time, giving these guys a chance to ramp down. That really was the line where all of a sudden Chapman had no command of his fastball. He was still throwing that breaking ball and that was getting him by, but he's nothing without the fastball, Tim. Everything rides on his fastball. They've got to gear up for that. That's why the breaking stuff works for him. If he can't command the fastball, he's just another guy. And he's been less than another guy lately. He's been horrible. His ERA is 18. I think in his last, whatever, five or six. Right. It's unbelievable. It's historic. Do you think we've seen the last of him? I know that we, he just made the all-star game, which is one of the like, and that's picked by the managers. I mean, the pitchers, when he was named to the all-star team, I was stunned. Well, I mean, I know his, he, he was hot to start the year, but there's got to be somebody better for that honor. Well, I think what happened though, Tim, is the voting for that had already been done. I mean, he, I think he had just started to go in the shitter. It might've been a couple games into it. And the voting was done. 
So if you base it from that point back, he was an all-star. It's just unfortunate that in the last two weeks before the announcement was made, he's been one of the worst pitchers in baseball. And the very day that it gets announced, right? <laughs> the very day it gets announced. It was, was the Mets, right? The Mets game. Yeah. It was, it was a Sunday. It was that Sunday. He, he had pitched and blown up the, the, the Saturday game, I think it was, whatever it was. And, oh, I, no, might have, maybe it was Sunday. They played a doubleheader. That was the doubleheader. It was the first game yeah. of the doubleheader, I think. Yeah, him and Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole was horrible, and so was Chapman. I think it was the same game, actually. And, and 20 minutes later, they're picked for the All-Star team. So the timing was just impeccable. But, look, Chapman, you know, I, I don't think he should have been in the All-Star game. They didn't pitch him. I swear to God, I'm sure Aaron Boone, Cashman, ah. whoever was – I forget it was even managing the, the AL, and said, don't you put this guy in the game. I'm sure that was a call that was made, but look, he's got to get it together, Tim. If, if he doesn't get it, together, help, help me out though. Who, who did, who did manage uh, the AL? I forget who was, Oh, I must, it was Kevin cash because the, the, the Rays made the world series. So if you're Kevin cash, I'd, oh. I'd, I'd have to put him in just because that's the Yankees. I, I, well, I'll give the, the Yankees a disadvantage. I'll go ahead there and have him get shelled against the best uh, pitchers in the game or get yeah, the I, best I, I, hitters I, in the game. I should say. I give Cash credit. He kept uh, Cole didn't pitch either. He, he, he left Cole and Chapman out, which is which is good. But look, Chapman, he's got to get it together. They, they, I mean, I don't think they're going anywhere, Tim. I've been saying this for two months. This for me, this goes back way before this recent downturn. I, I don't. I didn't think they had a chance to go to the postseason as far back as you know the middle of June because you could tell this team just is not built the right way, and there were going to be problems that they weren't going to be able to overcome. Not to mention the fact the Rays and the Red Sox are pretty damn good. So I don't think they're going anywhere, but they're certainly going nowhere if Chapman can't get it together. Yeah, that just for the record, uh, because the game is postponed, this uh, stat will actually stand up whether you're listening to this podcast on Thursday or Friday. Hell, maybe even into the into the weekend. We don't know what this <laughs> COVID thing is going to be. But the Yankees are 46 and 43 uh, coming out of the All-Star break. They're eight games back in the East and six and a half games back in the wild card chase. But I should mention, though, they're eight games back in the East, which not that great to begin with, but they're also second from the bottom. They're tied with the Blue Jays. They have a lot of – there's too much yeah. in between the Yankees and first place within those eight games. It's not just eight games. Um, but with all that said, 46 and 43 – uh, they did, uh, prior to that loss, right before the break, they'd won five out of six. But right before that, they'd lost seven out of eight. But you keep mentioning they're not built right. What do you think is, they're, even though they're at 46 and 43, what is it that will that that is the, the gap they just can't cross? What is, what is the, what's the, what's the holdup? To me, Tim, it's very simple. The Yankees' main problem is they have a bunch of hitters who have the same exact approach. It's all or nothing. It's home runs or it's going to be strikeouts. Now, I know that can be said about a lot of players and a lot of teams in baseball, but the, what compounds the Yankees' problem is when they don't hit a home run, they rarely, rarely just hit singles or doubles with men in scoring position to get the run across. They, they struggled so much to get runs across the plate if they don't hit it over the fence. Most teams, at least the good teams, the playoff teams, are going to hit home runs. I mean, it's a fallacy to believe that, oh, home runs don't mean anything. They mean a lot. They're the most important aspect of offense in baseball. Hitting the ball over the fence is a run. But you've got to find ways, Tim, to get runners across the plate without hitting a home run, and the Yankees can't do it. They're, if they're not the worst team – with runners in scoring position, they've got to be bottom three or four for sure. I, I know that's a fact. Their base running, they've pissed away so many runs on the base paths, Tim. I think they have the worst base running statistics in Major League Baseball. I think it's 33 outs now they've run into. They've had, they've had like 12 guys thrown out at the plate. I mean, just unbelievably bad decisions, poor execution. Another problem with that is they're very unathletic team, Tim. There are, there are no great athletes. On, they got a bunch of plotting guys. Who, when they do get on base, everything is station to station. I think they have the lowest percentage. Again, we're getting way analytical, but I think I saw a stat. They have the worst 
percentage of guys taking the extra base. So first to third or second to home or whatever it is, they're last in the league because they got a bunch of guys like Stanton who can't run and Sanchez and Urshela. All these guys can't run. So they get on base and it takes three hits to get them in. <laughs> they, they don't hit doubles anymore. They just don't do anything that you need to do on offense. It's, it's been maddening to watch. I, I don't want to distill it because there's a lot of nuance in what you just said, but a couple of the one phrase that you just mentioned there, and then a phrase that I've been thinking as you were talking station to station. All right. That happens. That's good baseball. That happens. You know, Tony La Russa would, you know, has gotten to the hall of fame with it. Um, you know, the teams have won the world series going station to station. Uh, but it's hard to be a station to station team when you can't play small ball, That's when right. you can't even, you can't even fathom it, let alone execute it. Uh, so like you just, and, and as you just said, so eloquently, yeah, three, three singles uh, to score a run um, or to, just to get one across, um, sure. you know, I looked it up the runs. Uh, if you factor in the NL teams, uh, the Yankees rankings are more mediocre because the worst run producing teams happen to be in the NL this year, but in the American league, the Yankees are only four runs have only four more runs than the team that's in last place. Yeah, the Orioles. Uh, right. So, and that's a lot of games to go by and to only have picked up four runs on the Orioles. Um, tell me, uh, since we're on a roll here, um, what are your thoughts on one of your favorite uh, targets, uh, Gary Sanchez? <laughs> because he's a, I mean, he, as far as Gary Sanchez goes, he's been a highlight, right? He's been, he's been better lately. Although I shouldn't say lately, the last couple of weeks, he sort of reverted back to, you know, regression is to the mean, right? He had a nice hot month. He started terrible and he, he did start to pick it up. He was one of the better hitters. Um, but again, he's kind of slid back a little bit, but Tim, this goes back three years with him. This is not just, I mean, he was awful last year. You know, everyone will use the excuse that it was a short season and all the stuff that went into that. He was God awful. He's one of the worst players in baseball last year, but this really goes back to, you know, I would say midway through 2018, there was a point, when he first made his debut, he looked like he was going to be Johnny Bench, for Christ's sakes. I mean, he was unbelievable. And then he had a very good 2017, the year that the Yankees kind of surprised people and got to the ALCS. That was a bit of a surprise. We didn't expect that. Starting around midway through 2018, though, Tim, he has not been a good hitter. And it just continued. He still hits his home runs, but he does nothing else. And I, you know, again, I know I'm old school, but I can't stand – the constant analytical people who say that RBIs and batting average mean nothing. They do mean something. Batting average means you're getting hits. I don't give a shit about all these other analytical things. If you're not getting on base, you're not hitting. Okay. If you're not driving in runs, oh yeah, RBIs mean nothing. You're making outs. Factors, so many other factors are in play. You got to have guys on base. Okay, fine. You got to have someone to drive those people in. <laughs> the Yankees don't have enough guys that are driving people in. So Sanchez, he's made progress at the plate. I think he's still a lousy catcher. I, I, I just, he oh. defensively, he's just not a good catcher. He hasn't been as bad. I think this year, I think he's improved a little bit, but he's still a bottom. He's to me, he's a bottom tier defensive catcher. So if they could move him in some way, Tim, I, I would be all for that. Quite frankly, they could move anybody on that roster right now. And I wouldn't even blink an eye. And that includes Aaron judge because you might actually get something for Aaron Judge. They'll never do it, but I don't think a guy on that team should be should be off the trading block when it comes up in two weeks. Are you okay with prospects? Because if you're in a sell mode, that you're probably not looking at a, you know, a, one of those trades where it's going to be good for both teams at this point. Do you, think, do you think they can mix up their roster enough to make a run at it this year, or would you rather be looking at 2022? Yeah, I would rather not be worrying about this season. Honestly, I just don't see that. Hey, I don't, I don't think they're going to get there in the first place, but even if they did, Tim, where are they going? This team is not built to win a championship. They're just not going to do it. So why waste your time? Why waste my aggravation every night? Why haven't I watch it? I would rather they, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to say they're going to punt. They will never say that. But really, Tim, if I was the Yankees, I would start thinking about 2022. Don't gut it. Don't trade the whole team July 31st, but they should be thinking about ways to look to the future. And I don't want to see guys that are, you know, right now we're in class A. I don't want trades like that because you aren't going to see them for three years anyways. Get some usable pieces that they can plug in next season and, and t 
turn this roster over. Start churning it. They've had the same guys doing the same things for too long, and it needs an overhaul. Last question for the Yankees, uh, unless you have something else you want to mention about them, but uh, Aaron Boone. Um, yeah, not good. His, not, not good enough. I mean, his contract's up. They haven't extended him, which tells me that they're probably going to move on. You and I both know coaches in limbo, managers in limbo. It's, it's, on, it's generally a sign. Anybody so, out there you like? No. I, honestly, Tim, in, in today's day and age, I, don't, I, don't, I really don't care who the manager is. I, I'm done with Boone. I've seen four years of that, and I'm done, so I do want them to move on. But really, I don't care who the manager is. The, to me, and, and quite frankly, I feel that way in, in most sports. I don't generally care who the coach is. Players. You need players. You need performers, guys that can go out and do it. The coach or the manager is not doing it. The players are. So they can put anybody they want in there. Just get some players who can start playing the game the way it needs to be played. And right now the Yankees don't play the game the way it needs to be played. We're in conversation with Sal Mayorana of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle here on Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. Uh, Sal, um, let's take a quick uh, spin uh, through your head regarding uh, thoughts on Bill's training camp, which opens uh, in a couple of weeks, not at St. John Fisher. So your first thought is probably the mileage that's going to be added to your car uh, and the extra driving that you're not used to having to do during training camp. Uh, But let's let's, uh, ask this way. Aside from Josh Allen, on the first day of camp, what do you think the top, let's say the first two or three days of camp, because sometimes we can't get to it all on the first day and it, it takes a little while to sort through as we get the chance to talk to different guys. We can't talk to them all at the same time um, necessarily. What do you think the top handful of stories are going to be when all the reporters descend upon one bill's drive and start to uh, have access to all these guys? Well, I would say the one story that I really don't want to have to deal with is how many guys are wearing masks around the facility, right? I mean, I but that's know. a clue for us, right? Doesn't that isn't that an indicator of who is and who is not vaccinated? That's what I'm getting at. I mean, I know I'm I don't know where you are on the vaccine, but I know that I'm in the smart category and I've got my vaccine, and it really rankles my mind what guys like Cole Beasley and maybe Josh Allen and Tremaine Edwards, we're not sure yet, what these guys are thinking. I, I just we can get on a whole tangent, and I don't want to do that. But for Christ's sakes, Tim. Why not? Team. You're on a team over there, okay? It's clearly a benefit to have the vaccine, to make sure you're protected. And to me, it's just plain selfish that Cole Beasley would go on the rants that he's gone on in the last couple of months not to get the vaccine. That's what I'll be looking at. I, I want to know where this team is at. Are they going to get to that 85% threshold that you know Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean they're going to be pissed if they're not there. Maybe you disagree with me, but I, I absolutely do. I, I, that's the main story. That's the best, the first day story that I think is important But for crying out loud. If there comes a point in this season when they are thinking they are legitimate Super Bowl contenders and one of these knuckleheads comes down with COVID Josh Allen, for instance, and he can't play in a game. I mean, I got to believe that Bill fans are going to lose their minds because this is such an avoidable problem. It's such an avoidable problem, but I think it's going to be a problem. What do you think? It's just, well, it's a strange phenomenon that we've seen the arc of it. Um, Josh Allen does not say he's anti-vaccine, but really talked his way. He went way out of his way to not uh, promote vaccines when he was on that uh, podcast earlier this summer. Um, And, it was interesting to see the number of fans that just rushed to Josh Allen's defense. And I think that that, a lot of that comes from, you know, look, Western New York sports, there's an inferiority complex there. They haven't had a quarterback in so long. Uh, You know, let's not upset Josh Allen. You know, let's, you know, Josh Allen's our guy. Thank God we have Josh Allen. Let's not, you know, we don't want to lose him in free agency. We got to just, no matter what, show him love. But then what Cole Beasley did, I think, really turned uh, the tide in terms of any kind of backing on that. Now, I think any fans uh, who just want to immediately rush to a Bills superstar's defense over vaccinations, I think, are going to cast a little 
maybe side eye are going to be more hesitant to do that because now it's way out there in the open. And a lot of people saw this is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, there are Hall of Fame coaches and you hear them say it all the time. You know, Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick have done it. They've used this quote, the mantra, the team, the team, the team. And if this puts them at a competitive disadvantage, whether it be protocols that they are or are not allowed to be in, in terms of meetings or travel or sideline or, or whatever, um, that's one reason to be that it's bad. And the other reason is, as you said, uh, a player that can't play. Um, and all of a sudden on Thursday, uh, Mitch Trubisky, you're starting uh, or wh whoever else, or maybe it wipes out the whole quarterback room. Um, and it's not just Josh Allen and Cole Beasley. It's, uh, you know, Jordan Poyer and his uh, significant other. Um, uh, the people who, uh, John Feliciano, uh, there are a lot of people who've been liking and retweeting and saying, yeah, 100, you know, on there, yeah. uh, Isaiah yeah. McKenzie. So it is, uh, I think it is the story of camp because this is a team that's otherwise pretty set. I mean, uh, people are mostly in the same positions. Yeah, we can talk about where's the pass rush going to come from. We can talk about who's going to step up at tight end if they're going to get production, uh, production from that uh, position. Running back, uh, you know, out of that committee, what's going to happen? But I mean, those we're used to having major storylines. You know, we're talking yeah. overhauls, new coordinator, um, you know, new quarterback, new that, whatever, a new system. Um, this is very minor stuff. This is a tweaking time for a team that's really good and is a potential Super Bowl contender. I still think they needed to find a way to get better than the Chiefs. The Chiefs went out and did some stuff. Yep. I don't know that the Bills kept pace with a team that crushed them pretty good uh, twice last year. Uh, but, you know, any given Sunday. Uh, yep. Anyway, so that's how I, I agree. Feel. I agree with that. I, I don't think they've done enough to overtake the chiefs. I mean, it could happen, but, and everyone talks about continuity being a great thing. And it is, it certainly is, you know, Dable has been, has had Josh Allen his whole career. That's all great, but you know, <laughs> it's the exact same roster with the exception of Emmanuel Sanders for John Brown, at least the top, when you count the specialists, the top 25 guys are really all the same. So was that good enough last year? It gave the bills a great season, a season for the ages, really. 501 points, 13 wins in the regular. That was all great, but is that the limit? I mean, can they match that with the exact same players who are now a year older? I think there was some areas maybe they could have they could have tweaked, and they didn't. So again, there, and when you say a year older, that's good in some cases. Josh some Allen cases, a year older is good, right? Um, but Cole Beasley a year older is not, right? Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison and all those guys. Right. So you know, we'll see. We'll see what if, if continuity is more important or. Maybe they needed to make some tweaks to take that final step. But like we said at the start, I still think early on training camp for me, I don't care. Well, I've never really cared about training camp per se. It's practice for Christ's sake. All, there's so many guys on the beat. I know they love going to practice and everything's important. You I, and I are looking for the patch of shade. <laughs> exactly. Generally, I don't care who's doing what. Unless somebody's hurt out there, I want to see it in game. I'll go through the preseason let me see something in action. That's how many years did we see Trent Edwards look fantastic yeah. in training camp, right? How I mean, there's only so much you can get excited about. Tim, there's there's a book that could be written about guys who were great in training camp and didn't do anything for the Bills throughout their career. So I'm not really interested in what's going to be happening on the field. I think this COVID issue is one that's going to be very integral to watch. And then, of course, injuries. Hopefully they can get through because they did. They, there was some problems. Last year, right? Feliciano got hurt. There were guys that were out. That they but had... by and large, though, Sal, they avoided injuries. They and, have for two you years. Know, John Brown was banged up and stuff. But yeah, you ha you can't. I don't think you can count on them being as injury free as they were last year. And what I meant know? was in training camp, they they didn't really have too many injuries that were devastating. Feliciano, yes, we talked about it. Right. So I'll be interested in that. You know, can they get through training camp and go into the season? with their full roster. I think that's going to be important. So I'll be watching that situation, the COVID situation and everything else, Tim, just wake me up on a September 12th. Really? I mean, let's just get to the season. This team is built. They're ready to go. <laughs> I, I can't wait till September 12th, but from now until then, I'm not going to be losing my, losing my mind over what's happening at one bills drive. 
just prep, uh, stay healthy, and get ready. I'll take it a step further, and I, I really don't think we know anything. That includes, yeah. you know, September. Whatever. I don't think we know anything. I don't think – coaches have said, on the record, I've interviewed them, they don't even know what their team is until the middle of October yeah. because they're working things out. They don't know how they stand within the rest of the league. You do have some injuries that have happened. You've had to work, you've had to rely on a system that you can't really back out of by now. You you know whether or not your guys are picking it up and and you have have momentum or they're um, they're dialed in or whatever whatever distractions have have come up and and maybe derailed you or made your team even closer. There are things that happen that and yeah, Bill Belichick has said that a number of times. You don't really know until the middle of October, yeah. and you start seeing where the standings are, how your team has responded to a loss. Um, how your team has responded to something that really goes wrong during the course of a game. Does, you know, does your team lose its composure? Uh, do they take everything in stride like badasses? Uh, you hope that, um, that the bill, I think they're capable of being badasses. Um, I think Josh Allen is a, a badass in waiting. Um, I want to see, I want to see more than just the one year, but I think yeah. we saw enough that, that I don't think that was fluky. I don't think you put together 16 games like that or plus six more than 16 games in, in, and be, you know, lucky. Uh, but um, there have been quarterbacks that have had a really good year and yeah. not followed up on it, but. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a believer in Josh Allen. I think what we saw last year, and that's, let's face it. He's made steady. Well, he made decent enough progress from year one to year two. And then the humongous jump last year. I don't think <laughs> we're not going to have a jump like that again this year. But I've been encouraged by it hasn't been up down. He's been on an ascending line. He happened to take a humongous step last year. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't think he's going to probably produce 46 touchdowns and 4,500 yards again. But I think he's going to be in that range where he'll be a top five quarterback in the NFL. So I do want to see it a second year. I'm not ready to say, yeah, he's going to be the next Hall of Famer in, in Bill's colors. Let's see it for a stretch of time. But I feel pretty good that he is going to get there at some point. And I think the pieces they have around him, I mean, I can't imagine, now, unlike the Yankees, who the, the roster construction there is completely bizarre. I think this Bills roster is put together magnificently. I think B's done a great job in the pieces he's brought in, how they fit them all together. He's got the right coach in place, you know, in terms of certainly culture. I mean, you can, people laugh about it, but that culture and process has done the Bills a lot of good. Would you agree? I mean, it has. We, we, we laugh at McDermott all the time about the words, but I think the words actually mean something for the Bills and this team. I'm a process and culture guy, and I do know that you need good players to win. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, it's not so much stratomatic to me as a lot of people say, well, culture is winning, and you need good players, and if you have enough good players, they win, and that's your culture. Bullshit. Yeah. Um, it does matter. Uh, and because it's what's expected of you. It helps you deal with um, distractions. It helps you block those things out. Um, it's I, I, anyways, I'm a believer of it. I, I don't have the, the, the paperwork in front of me that, that, that can uh, make, make the case for me, but you know, I've, I've seen it. I do think that culture and process can make some players even better. Um, so totally you, it's not just, you know, I'm going to put my, like my son builds his uh, Madden team on the, you know, with the GM function and, uh, they go out there and play, uh, they're, they don't have, uh, a, a DUI arrest and Madden, uh, you know, they don't have the guy, uh, who got caught with the gun, uh, get suspended. Uh, they don't have, uh, the guy shred his knee. Uh, well, I guess they do have some injuries, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things you have to deal with. And if you are a team of, you know, if you're a Rex Ryan team, you have a tendency not to deal with that shit uh, very That's well. Right. That's uh, it. When you're That's a Sean McDermott right. team, so far they've had the ability to deal with that shit pretty well. I think, um, I think that one, I think the key or one of the keys is going to be, Tim, the start they get off to. I mean, they're, they're, they're the hunted now. There's no question they are the hunted. Um, you know, the Patriots are not going to be down, the Patriots are going to bounce back. I don't know what the quarterback situation is going to be there, but that team is not going to be the team we saw last year. They're going to push the bills. Maybe the dolphins do too. The bills are going to get everyone's best shot. It's a cliche, but it's true. They became that team last year. 
So I think the start's going to be very important. I think they got to get off to a good start, make sure they, re, they you know, they have their confidence. They, they realize that, yes, we can do this again. We are that team. And I think if they get off to a good start, then I think Bill's fans are going to be in for a pretty, you know, as long as they stay healthy, I think it's going to be a pretty fun year for Bill's fans. Let me ask you, this would be the last question for you, Sal, but I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this because of your history covering this team. Um, and I'm, hesitant to compare them to the Super Bowl Bills. But there was a time, I mean, if the Bills ever do get back to where they're competing for Super Bowls, there is going to be a season like we just had as a harbinger of what's to come. Um, And I know you started right when they did go to the Super Bowl, but is there anything that you'll be looking for, like you say, I don't want to just a cliche of swagger, or being able to absorb a, a knockout punch and not fall down. Um, but when you look back on the Bills team that went to the AFC championship game against Cincinnati, I think it was 88, right? And then the right. 89, they didn't quite get there. That was the Ronnie Harmon drop in Cleveland. And yep. then they went on their run. Uh, is there something, because Bills fans prior to 88 weren't used to this, uh, and then they got there. I'm not talking about the fans, but the team. Right, right. And then what you were looking for are the things that made that convinced you about those teams that okay, these guys are good. Um, this is this is legit. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's going to be parallels, I think, to what happened in '88. That was a season. I mean, very like, very much like last year. Nobody thought the Bills were going to win 13 games and score 500 points. Nobody. That was the same situation in '88, Tim. I mean, they were still in Nowheresville. Yeah, they had uh, Jim Kelly in place, Daryl Talley, Bruce Smith, Andre Reid. They were about to get Thurman Thomas. Last year, last year just to remind everybody, because I think people have a short, they have a longer memory when that stuff, but the short memory should be polished a little bit here. Because when you got to the end of last season, there were a lot of fans and media that were saying, of course we expected this. How could we have not seen it? There, were, there was that sentiment. Yeah. But the storyline this time last year, if we were talking, it would be it's a successful Bills season if they can make the playoffs and win the division because Tom Brady's not in it. That was a test. But win a playoff game was considered, I think, was the barometer. Yeah. And they went way beyond that. They did. And Josh Allen. Everyone was looking at. Right. So I didn't want to say that people look at it and be like, oh, no, that's that's the way we expected it. But that was. That was probably similar to 88, right? Yeah. Nobody well, expected them to get to the AFC championship game. That's what I was saying. I mean, they were still nowhere to that, that team. They, they had gone seven and eight the year before they lost the one game to the strike. So going into that season, nobody thought the Bills were going to go 12 and four and get to the AFC championships game, similar to this past year. Now, that team clearly <laughs> had Hall of Famers on it, had a Hall of Fame coach. So you could maybe guess that that team was certainly going to be on the rise. But then look what happened, Tim. 1989 was a veritable, wasn't a disaster because they won the division. It was a bad division that year. They won it with nine and seven, and then the Ronnie Harmon play. But that was a bad year after what we had just seen. Everyone was thinking 89 was going to be the team that would go to the Super Bowl. They had all those guys in place, and it didn't happen. So that would be the worry that I would have this year. Would history repeat itself? But there's a, there's a lot of similarities and parallels there. Polian was the, was the GM. Levy. Now you've got Bean and McDermott. Kelly was just in his third year, fourth year. Here's Josh Allen, third. There's a lot of parallels there. So I hope they don't repeat that history, but I don't think they will. I, I don't think this team is going to have a nine and, well, now it's 17, a nine and eight type of season. I think they're going to avoid that. The question is going to be, can they take the next step? It's going to be a fascinating question all year. It really is going to be a fun thing to look forward to. And once you are good, the window's a lot smaller now than it was back then because of the salary cap. That was a non-salary cap era. That was pre-Reggie White and the whole thing. So once you yeah. did get those guys, once you were able to collect that talent, you could lock them up um, if you wanted to pay them, and, uh, which and Ralph Wilson were, at the time decided he was willing to do. Whereas yeah, this year, you got to cycle through these guys a little bit more because once you get good, then all of a sudden other teams want them. And, uh, and that's where culture does come into play where you get guys who are saying, I want to re-sign in Buffalo, uh, which wasn't – that that's not always an easy sell. Yeah, that's uh, why it was, think, it, it was easy for Marv Levy and Bill Pullian to set a culture back then because it was the same guys over and over. You built that team. They were the same guys. The same core guys were a part of 
the bulk of that Super Bowl run. These guys, Bean and McDermott, have a much different job, a much more, I'd say, a much more challenging job because you've got to keep retooling that. Now, they didn't do it this year. They pretty much stayed the same, but there's going to be churn in the years to come. You know, that Bills team went on, whatever, it was eight years of really, really outstanding play. Kings of the division, four Super Bowls. That's awfully tough to do today. And that's, I think, challenge the biggest challenge that Bean and McDermott have is can they keep this thing going where the Bills are going to be contenders every year and not have the fall off like they had, for instance, in 89. Or then after the Super Bowl run, the big fall off into the abyss of nothingness for 17 years. I yeah. It's so fondly, don't I, Tim? <laughs> I'm, I don't miss it. I mean, <laughs> there were parts of it that were great for journalism. You know, well, the, the turmoil and the chaos. But I think after it got to the point where, man, we were just so numb of it. It, wow. it is refreshing. I, mean, I, look at, I look at the Sabres now and, and the poor guys that are covering that team. I mean, what? I mean, we have the greatest job in the world, Tim. We do. I, bar none, the job that we do, it's the job of my life. I love it. But for crying out loud, it, when you got to go watch that product night after night, like those guys covering the Sabres, that's a tough ask. And the Bills, for a long, at least for the Bills, it was just once a week, right? We only had to put up with one game a week. But, man, those guys, I feel bad for those guys having to watch that team. And traveling to do it. Yeah. You know, it's traveling in the winter to Detroit, Winnipeg, uh, Winnipeg <laughs> or wherever. Yeah. Or St. Louis, you know, just yeah. to, to cover another game like that. Yeah, at least uh, – I hope we're out of that with the Bills. I hope we're on a path where, at least to my retirement, right? Which, I mean, I'm 58. I'm nearing the end here, I think. If they could just get me through the next four years, Tim, of, you know, a good product to watch and cover, I'll be, I'll be a happy man. I, they look like they're in good shape for that. Josh Allen's they're... good copy, I think. Yeah. Well, Sal, thanks for doing this. I hope I uh, entertained you and didn't swear too much. No, I, I enjoy it. Uh, we just have to be careful not to overdo it because then I think it seems dis disingenuous when you start yes. you know, dropping a. Dropping Although generally my swearing is anything. pretty is pretty genuine. No, it, it was good. It was for good effect. I yeah. think we we handled it quite well. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, Tim. Appreciate it. That's Sal Mayorana of the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle on TGAF, brought to you by CTBK. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.